So I think that everybody's always known that when the powerless have something controversial to say to power, or when somebody has a crime they need to report that isn't uh, that were going to be well received, or when somebody who's relatively powerless just wants to make their opinion heard in a context of power, they can sometimes not be believed when they should be. They can receive a level of credibility that's lower than it should be. And one way of thinking about that is that prejudice is always in the air between speakers and hearers, and sometimes it has this very negative and unjust effect of meaning that people are not believed when they should be. One way to theorize this phenomenon and to give it a useful label is to uh, think about it specifically in terms of prejudice and credibility, and that it's a kind of credibility deficit that's caused by prejudice. And I've theorized that in terms of the label testimonial injustice. And it's meant to be a label that covers not just testimony in a formal sense, as in a court of law, or if you're a witness to a crime, but testimony as in everyday cases of telling somebody something, offering an opinion, airing a reason, trying out a hypothesis. So any kind of speech act where you're looking to receive a certain level of credibility, but the credibility is reduced because of prejudice. That's what I've called testimonial injustice. One example of people putting this concept to use is that recently I had the privilege of being invited to go and speak in Bogota at the Memorial for Peace that is a monument created by the sculptor Doris Salcido in a series uh, of talks called Sexual Violence and Testimonial Injustice. And I spoke with a victim of sexual violence who has become a campaigner. And she spoke first to recount her story of sexual violence and her story of not being believed and of having her words suppressed and of being subject to threats. And then I joined in with the theoretical aspects which she told me she had found useful and the other campaigners told me they'd found useful in shaping their protest, in shaping what they wanted to achieve politically by bringing women's experiences to the fore. So in the 53 years of civil war in Colombia, uh, they say there's been a great deal of sexual violence against women which had not come to the fore. And there are many different uh, explanations and factors in how it's so difficult to report these crimes. Some factors are more structural than others. Some factors are to do with lack of education and the need for consciousness raising to help women actually articulate the experience to powerful bodies like the police. Others are to do with just uh, physical threats. But also there are aspects of prejudice which mean that there's a kind of stigmatization and a habit of victim blaming that they'd encountered so that when they did try to report crimes, they really weren't believed or not believed in the right way so that their word was taken seriously. So uh, it was very interesting for me to discover that they'd been using this term and had found it useful in their campaigning. So one of the many things I learned from the women there the campaigners and the victims of sexual violence was that for many victims, women who lived in the countryside and who'd had very little education and many of whom were illiterate, they didn't really have the resources or the support to be able to frame their experiences of these crimes in the kinds of concepts that are required to report them as crimes. So they hadn't been helped to say things like, he raped me or he was sexually violent. They might say things like, he hurt me or he was rough with me. And so part of the work of the campaigners is to enable women to actually communicate their experiences and make sense of their experiences in terms of the kinds of concepts that are necessary to report them as crimes. And that brings me to a different concept of epistemic injustice, namely hermeneutical injustice. And it's a little bit long to explain, but basically has two ingredients. If you're a member of a hermeneutically marginalized group, which means if you're a member of a group that doesn't get to contribute to the shared pool of concepts on equal terms with other groups, then you're at a kind of unfair disadvantage when it comes to making sense of your own experiences and communicating those experiences to others who might not share the concepts even if you do have the concepts yourself. When you attempt to communicate an experience across social space, for instance to a police force or to members of your family or to uh, colleagues who do not share the concepts or in other ways reject the concepts and resist the concepts that you need to make your experience intelligible, then you're subject to a hermeneutical injustice. 
And I think one of the things I learned from the women there was that many of them are subject to that kind of injustice. And so part of the work being done is to enable those women to um, frame their experiences differently and in a way that's effective for them when it comes to protesting what happened to them. So one of the thoughts that I came away with from that trip besides admiration for the women who were speaking out and campaigning and trying to make things better was that even in the midst of violence and threats of violence, there's an importance to people's ability to make full sense of their experiences and to know that they can actually communicate them across social space and be believed. And that not being believed or not having your word taken seriously, especially when you're talking about something really important, is a profoundly damaging and frustrating kind of injustice, which somehow lives alongside the other kinds of physically threatening and terrorizing injustices. And that people who are subject to those sorts of injustices care about both aspects. <laughs>